appreciate you getting all that ready on short notice. Take your Bible this evening, Philippians chapter 1, please. Philippians chapter 1. Thank you for your prayers for me. I'm doing much, much better. And uh, Brother Fielder called to see how I was doing and found out I'd been sick and he, he said, you know, the first two years he traveled, he was sick every time he came home. He said one missionary told him, he said, well, that's just your amoebas are still getting used to meeting everybody else's amoebas. And uh, you have to, he said, now he's fine when he comes home. He doesn't get sick at all. But, uh, boy, I tell you what, it's been, it's been something. You're going to start a meeting tomorrow night? You're crazy. <laughs> huh? Wow. I, I honestly, I, I, I don't hardly remember Sunday. I know I was here and I said something, but I don't remember much of what it was. But I tell you, it was, uh, we'll pray for Brother Yoder. All right. Philippians chapter 1. Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi with the bishops and deacons. Grace be unto you in peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making requests with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ, even as it is meet for me to think this of all you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. All, ye all are partakers of my grace. For God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound yet more and more in all knowledge and in all judgment, that ye may approve things that are excellent, that ye may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. I'm going to focus tonight on that thought in verse 10, that ye may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. Father, we ask your blessing now as we open up your word and begin to study it together tonight. Our prayer is that we could study to show ourselves approved unto God, workmen that need not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And so, Holy Spirit of God, please help me as I bring this study. And Lord, bring to my mind anything that I need to say that I've not planned to say. Lord, keep me from saying anything that I had planned to say, but I don't need to say. And so, Lord, I pray that you would help the people as they listen. And Lord, you be our teacher tonight as we look into your word. And I'll thank you for it. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Paul's writing to this church here in Philippi, and he loved these people. If you notice, they were in Christ Jesus at Philippi, all right? It would be the believers in Christ Jesus, or in, in Christ Jesus at Grove City, uh, if it was our church, okay? Uh, the important thing is not where you're at, the important thing is whether you're in or not, and uh, are you in Christ Jesus. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. And so you want to make sure we're in Christ. So we know that he's writing to believers. He's writing to those who are in Christ. And he loved these believers. Notice verse 3 when he said, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Notice verse 5 when he said, For your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. Did you notice verse 7 when he said, even as it is meet for me to think as of you all, because I have you in my heart. And then also again in verse number 8, when he said, God is my record, how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ. He, he loved this church. He loved these believers. And, and we're going to look tonight now, verse 9, he starts a prayer. And this I pray. And he prays that their love would abound in knowledge and judgment. And then he says, I'm praying that you would, verse 10, approve things that are excellent. <clears throat> approve things that are excellent. Things that are excellent 
are things that are of great virtue are worth. <coughs> when it says prove those things, it literally means that we're to be we're to we're to prove them or like them or be satisfied with them. We're to be pleased with things of great virtue and worth. That's what we're supposed to be proving. You know, we spend a lot of time on things that don't matter. If you're not careful, we spend our life on things that don't really matter. Uh, in, in the one lesson I brought in India on, on being a man of God, there's an old hymn, Rise Up, O Men of God. They were getting an old hymnal and looked that up. But the first verse says, Rise up, O men of God, be done with lesser things. Give heart and mind and soul and strength to serve the King of Kings. And so often we give our mind and heart and soul and strength into so many other things, we don't have much left over for God. And we're, we're, we, we spend it up on lesser things. And so he, here he's saying, I want you to prove things that are excellent. Setting a, setting a proper value on things is, <clears throat> is not is not so much distinguishing good from bad, but good from best. You know, as you grow in your Christian life, and, and the soul becomes more set apart to God, then you don't necessarily want sinful things anymore. Even your soul doesn't want those sinful things anymore. But you have to understand, your soul may want good things, but are they the best things? Your soul may want to do goodwill for people, but there's a difference between goodwill and God's will. And so you have to distinguish between the good and the best. And we want to focus our time and energy on things that really matter. Boy, this is a, some prayer to pray for people, isn't it? Praying that people would have the discernment that they'd have the ability to prove things that are excellent. The, most, the, the vast majority of believers don't test anything. Most believers today live by their moods and not by their minds. We live more by how we feel than by what we think. And a lot of times we don't want to think, we just want to be amused. Musement means to think. David said, while I mused, my heart burned within me. While I thought... And that's why, that's why you go to Cedar Point, it's called an awe amusement. Awe means without. You can go there and spend the whole day and never think. How cool is that, huh? Doesn't take much thought to ride a roller coaster. Ah! You know what I mean? You don't have to think much about it, all right? And so you, you don't think about that. It's just amusement. But, but, but we don't do much thinking anymore. Somebody says, oh, that guy's a deep thinker. No, probably he's just a thinker. We just don't have people who think anymore. And, and you need to take time to think and to prove things that are excellent. And uh, a lot of people, I read this this week, like the pilot who said to the people on the intercom, oh, I've got good news and bad news. The pilot said, we've lost all instrumentation and I don't know where we are. But he said, the good news is we have a tailwind and we're making great time. That's how many people live. Just by, uh, I'm in a good mood today. Well, what are you doing? I don't know, but I feel good. You know? Uh, there's no purpose. There's no direction. Just simply emotion. You know, when you distinguish what's important in life, what deserves your energy, what deserves your attention, and what doesn't, that's a mark of maturity where you're not running after every shiny object that comes along. Okay? That's, that's showing a mark of maturity. You can easily distract a child. Easily distract a baby to something else. Uh, it ought not to be that way for a mature Christian. Okay? And so you make sure you, you prove things that are excellent. Now, the standard uh, to not get, get drawn away by other things, of course, is the Word of God. Uh, the Word of God is how we approve all things. That's why 1 Thessalonians 5.21, Prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. And the way you prove everything is by the standard. And we have a standard. We have God's Word. It's not subjective. 
It's not, well, I think. And someone else says, well, that's what you think, but I think. And everybody's got their own opinions or their own thoughts. But we have a standard we go by. And we go by what God's Word says. And that's our standard of how we prove all things. And so ask yourself this. Am I approving the things that are excellent in my life? Or is my life filled with some things that just don't matter? You know, you, you think about if the doctor came in and said you have one week to live, how would you spend that week? And can I tell you, that's how you ought to spend the week every week? If you had one day to live, how would you spend the day? Well, that's how you ought to live today because we can't boast any of us of tomorrow. We know not what a day can bring forth. I'm sure that that Mr. Lewis, who went in to do his gym class, had no idea that this would be his last day he'd be on earth. He'd be in heaven. We don't know. We don't know that. And so we have to make sure that we're, we're, we're proving the things that are good. Pursuing the things that are excellent. All right? Now, let's look at a prayer about sincerity here. He says he prays to prove things that are excellent. Then he says, I'm praying that you would be sincere. You would be sincere. And I put, you'd be sincere within themselves. That sincere there means literally without wax. It's a word that means sincera from the Latin. It's, it's a, it means pure and transparent. Pure and transparent. And it means that uh, when it comes to our Christian character, that we're not to be deceitful, ambiguous, hypocritical, that we're not going to have lives that are mingled with worldliness and sin and things that we know are not pleasing to God. Where there's, where there's nothing disguised, not being a hypocrite or, or putting on a mask. I don't think there's any more desirable compliment as a believer that someone could say they are a sincere Christian. What I mean is they're transparent. What you see is what you get. They're not putting on any airs. <clears throat> when someone says you're sincere, it implies this. It implies you're truly saved. That you haven't just put on Christianity as a mask. Sometimes to the world, Christianity is what you do on a Sunday and then don't let that affect the rest of your life during the week. But we know that's not Christianity. That's religion, but that's not Christianity. Christianity is not something we do, it's something we are. And that means it's who I am uh, 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, 365 days a year, every day of my life. And so I can't separate that. I can't, you, you can't leave that at the church house. That goes with you everywhere you go. It's who you are. It's who we are. And so it's a sign that you're truly saved. Number two, it, or B there, it's, it means that your motives are pure. It means not only am I doing the right thing, but I'm really doing it for the right reason. Sincere. Not deceitful. Not hypocritical. No ulterior motive in mind. Okay? So my motives are pure. C, that... that it means that my conduct is free from trickery or deceit. I'm not trying to fool anybody. I'm not trying to pull something over on somebody. It means, D, that you mean exactly what you say. You don't say something and somebody says, I wonder what he meant by that. Huh? No, you don't have to wonder. Men mean what you say, say what you mean, mean what you say. It means exactly what you say. You're sincere. It means you're true to your word. It means you're faithful to your promises. If you say you're going to do it, you'll do it. Take it to the bank. Count on it. You're good for your word. You're good for your promises. Sincere. Sincere. Now, in ancient times, especially here in Philippi, one of the biggest industries in the world would be the pottery industry. And pottery of all varied kinds uh, would, would be there. And by the way, varied not only in shapes and sizes and vessels, but varied in quality as well, uh, would be present, not unlike today. Uh, different, different quality of goods. And, and so the, 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 the cheapest pottery was very thick 
and, and heavy and didn't really require a lot of skill to make. Uh, you kept things thick and solid and you'd put it in the oven to bake and you'd let it bake and then you pull it out and it really not much skill involved. The finer pottery and the more expensive pottery would be thinner and much more difficult not only for the potter to make but to bake in the oven without it cracking. And so they'd have to have a certain temperature and watch it carefully, pull it out at the right time, and, and, and be very careful when they were firing the oven and, and taking it out of the oven. What uh, would often happen, the pottery would crack. To, to fix this without having to scrap the pottery, they, they would take wax and fill the crack and then color it the same as the pottery. And so when you would go inside the, the tent, under the tent, or under the awning where they would be, you'd look at it and think it looks like a perfectly good vessel. Until you put something in it, took it home, put it in your oven or over your fire to try to cook something, and once you, once you got that wax good and hot, guess what happened? Huh, yeah, all of a sudden you got a leaky vessel. And you know you got took. Okay? So what would happen, they, there, there's two things that would take place. The... Um, people would take the pottery and they would take it out from under the tent or the awning and they'd hold it up to the sunlight. And the sunlight hitting it, would, they would see the wax. And the other thing that the finer, the, the honest dealers would do, they would put on the bottom of their pottery, sign, S-I-N-E, Sarah, without wax. And then you could look at that and say, they're guaranteeing me this is without wax. And there's, there's nothing hiding the flaws here. They're, they're, we are sincere. We're, we're not saying that there's not any flaw, that, that the flaws here and we've, we've hidden them. And so honest dealers would mark it without wax. And so the, the knowledgeable buyer would always hold it up to the sun and they would always look at the bottom of it to see if that phrase, Saint Sarah, was there to say it was without wax, assuring them that it would be in excellent condition. And you know, all that to say this, the flaws of our life, and all of us have them. There's, for all have been flawed and come short of the glory of God, okay? Uh, there's none unflawed, no, not one, okay? And so we all have flaws, and, and we don't cover them up with wax. We don't, we don't put on a front like we don't have any flaws, Okay? It's easy to happen in church. Somebody tell you a problem, and, and there's certain things that you say, oh, I don't, some people won't even come forward and use an altar because they don't think any, I don't anybody know I got a problem. Really? Huh? Guess what? We all got problems. We all got issues. Somebody says, oh, well, look, look, watch out for her. She's got issues. Well, you know what? We're all in the I got issues club. Okay? I mean, let's face it. What, what, what are we trying to fool? God knows. God knows about us. And so we don't, we don't try to put on any, any airs. We're not trying to put on a mask. We're not trying to fill our cracks with wax and make sure that we appear to everybody to be great. And, and, and it's, it, we ought to, well, all of us be stamped without wax. And so don't disguise them artificially. When you do that, the Bible calls you a hypocrite. A hypocrite. Remember, anytime you're pointing a finger at somebody, you've got three others coming right back at you. Don't forget that. So Paul is praying for their integrity. He's praying for their purity. And, uh, and, and what it is, the light of God's Word will show our cracks. They'll show our flaws. Look at, uh, hold your finger there in Philippians and look at Hebrews chapter 4. <clears throat> Some of you are familiar with this verse, but look at Hebrews 4 and verse 12. This will begin to show what, where our flaws are. The Bible says the Word of God is quick. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. Hebrews 4 and verse 12. For the Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow. Hey, all of that's inside. Getting down deep, isn't it? And it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. But listen, 
My heart's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? I can't even know it. You can't even know it. You say, as far as I know my heart, I, 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 my motive's pure. Well, you know how you're going to know for sure? Let the Word of God, let the light of God's Word, thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Boy, let the light of God's Word shine on your heart. It'll, it'll show the flaws. It'll show if there's something that needs to be corrected. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. Again, Paul here, I think, is dealing with the Word of God. <clears throat> and his ministering the Word of God, those of us who would teach or preach the Word of God, notice what he said, verse 12, our rejoicing, 2 Corinthians 1, 12, our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation, our life, our behavior in this world, and more abundantly to you word. Godly sincerity. And then notice in chapter 2, he deals with it again in verse 17. He says, For we are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity, but as of God. In the sight of God, speak we in Christ. Here he talks about there are those who corrupt the Word of God. And you know what Paul said about them? He says, they're not sincere. They're, they're, they're masking their true intentions. He said, we're going to be sincere in giving you the Word of God. We're not going to try to hide anything or, or be, a, be deceitful about it. He calls for genuineness, honestness, integrity, transparency of character when it comes that, listen, so that the people can see Christ. He said it's godly sincerity. He said in sincerity as of God. Okay? When, and, and boy, the world's longing for sincere Christians. And, and we just have to let them know we're, we're, we're going to be sincere within ourselves without wax. All right. Then number two, he says, I'm praying that they would be without offense toward others. Without offense toward others. We're to walk so as not to be a stumbling block. When the Bible talks about being blameless, it means you're not causing someone else to stumble. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10, would you please? 1 Corinthians chapter 10. In 1 Corinthians 10, he's talking about the Corinthians were struggling whether they should, some of them, should we eat meat that I know has been offered to an idol? You know, some of them come out of idolatry and been saved and they said, man, I know this meat was offered to idols. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And other people didn't have that background and they said, man, I think it looks good to me. Let's, let's have that piece of steak, you know. And uh, they said, what, what are we supposed to do about this? And so, Paul told him, verse 31, you know this one, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, neither to the Jews, nor to the Gentiles, nor to the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many, that they may be saved. Paul said, listen, I'm not just thinking of myself. The Christian can't say, hey, I'm going to do this. I don't care if it hair lips you or not. I don't care if it bothers you or not. I don't care if everybody gets upset with me. I don't care what you think. No, no, that's not a Christian. A Christian has to think about others and the effect what I'm going to do is going to have on their life. I don't want to be a cause of them to stumble. I don't want to be an offense to somebody else. I want to be without offense, not causing somebody else to stumble in their Christian life by what they would see me do. <clears throat> so it's, it's, it's without offense towards others. See, does your life encourage other people to godliness? Does your life encourage other people to godliness? 
or does it cause them to stumble? Look at Matthew 18 with me, will you please? Matthew chapter 18. You doing all right? Everybody okay? All right. Matthew 18. Notice verse 2. Jesus called a little child unto him and set him in the midst of them and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoso shall receive one such little child in my name receiveth me. Now watch. But whoso shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and that he were drowned in the depth of the sea. Woe unto the world because of offenses. For it must needs be that offenses come. But woe to the man by whom the offense cometh. See, Jesus is saying here, uh, you, you, you're better off dead than causing a, 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 especially a child to stumble in their Christian faith. That's pretty serious. It's in this context of causing somebody else to stumble or somebody else to, 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 to be hurt in their Christian walk that he said, if your hand or foot offend thee, cut it off. Man, that, that's how serious he's taking this idea that, that you don't become offense to somebody else. Think about that. Parents, do you cause your children to sin? What was it Paul told the fathers? Provoke not your children to wrath. See, we have to be so careful about whether we're going to be an offense to somebody else and cause, be a cause of stumbling to someone else. So it's a reference to our influence, is it not? That's why the Bible says the sins of the fathers are visited under the children, to the third and the fourth generation. Influence. How's your influence? So he says, I'm praying that you'll be sincere, and I think that's sincere in regards to yourselves, and then without offense in regards to others. And then he says, number three, I'm praying that you'll do that, and you'll continue until the day of Christ. Back in verse 10 of Philippians chapter 1. <clears throat> you, may be, you may approve things that are excellent. You may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. So Paul's telling the first century Christians here in Philippi that they're to live sincere and without offense until they see Christ, until Christ returns. Now, why would he tell them that if he didn't think Christ was going to return in their lifetime. If Christ wasn't returning yet for thousands of years, why would he even bring that up? It would have no bearing, would it? No. None. You see, if, if Christ wasn't going to return for thousands of years, he'd have no reason to say that to the Philippian believers. But I believe the day of Christ, I believe the return of Christ was something that all first century Christians really believed that they'd see, that they would get to be a part of. And, and, and they're expecting. Notice, he said in verse 6 of chapter 1, He which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Hey, he's going to be at work in you until, he, until you see him. And, and that could be uh, any time. And so he knows that we're to live this way until we see Christ. There's, there's no end to that. There's no rest from this. There's no uh, reprieve from this. This is how we live. We're sincere and without offense until the day of Christ. Now, in that day, as believers, we'll go to what's called the judgment seat of Christ. The judgment seat of who? And Christ is God the Son. Not S-U-N, but S-O-N. And we'll be held up in front of the Son. 
to see if we've filled the wax in anywhere to try to hide our flaws and try to cover up where, where we tried to make people think we were better than what we were. Or we were, uh, we, 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 we were, where we were hypocritical. That's why, look over at 1 Corinthians 4, would you? 1 Corinthians 4. Let me ask you a question. How many of you think that the judgment seat of Christ can be a rather frightening thought? The standing before Christ where the Bible says that, that our hearts are going to be made manifest. That our works are going to be tried of what sort they were. In other words, not how much they were, of what sort they were. Not just what we did, but why did we do it? The counsels of our heart are going to be made manifest. How many of you think that could be a quite frightening thing? Okay, Let's look and see what he says. Paul here is writing to Corinthians and he says in verse number 3, But with me it is a very small thing that I should be judged of you, or of man's judgment. Yea, I judge not mine own self, for I know nothing by myself. Yet am I not hereby justified? He that judgeth me is who? The Lord. Now watch. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord come. Well, when the Lord come, what's He going to do? He's going to bring to light the hidden things of darkness and will make manifest the counsels of the hearts. Did you read that? So He's going to be, look this way. He's going to make manifest our heart, what our motives were, why we did what we did, and our counsels, what our thoughts were. Well, I better do this because they're watching me. I want them to think I'm a good Christian. Hmm? Well, I better, I better say this because it'll sound like I'm, everybody will think I'm spiritual, I'm right with God, even though I haven't looked at my Bible all week long. But I know when to say amen, and I know when to say yes, praise the Lord. See, I'm just, I'm just covering up with wax. God says, I'm going to reveal all that. That is, that is a frightening thing. But the, uh, years ago, I th- I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was Harry Ironside who I was reading one time, and he pointed this out, and I never forgot it. Because that's mostly all you ever hear about the judgment seat of Christ. And it's a very frightening thing. But the verse doesn't stop there. Look at verse 5 again. He says, he's going to bring the light, the hidden things of darkness, and will make manifest the counsels of hearts, and then shall every man have condemnation of God. Oh, that's not what it says, is it? If yours says that, you have the wrong Bible. And then shall every man have what? Praise of God. Wow. I didn't expect that. And by the way, not some men, not most men, every man and woman, every single person is going to have praise of God. It's going to bring to light those hidden things of darkness and the counsel of the heart, but then God says, I'm going to find something to praise every man for. I'll find something in their life, even the hidden things and the counsels of your heart, and I'll still find something to praise every man for. Then let me ask you a question. If that's what God could do, couldn't we do that? Aren't we, aren't we so good at pointing out the flaws where, where people maybe didn't have the right motive or they maybe didn't have the right thought? Instead of finding the good thing to praise them for, we only focus on the negative thing to criticize them about. Couldn't we be a little more like God? And though we know, though we know the bad, we could praise the good. That's what God does. And that's what He did here. That's why the Bible says, we don't let corrupt communication proceed of our mouth, but that, way, that which may minister... Grace to the hearers. What's grace? 
Yeah, something we don't deserve. He says, well, I'd say that about them, but they don't deserve it. Well, then be gracious and say it anyway. See? That's what it means to minister grace to the hearer. It means you go ahead and say it when they don't deserve it. It's all right. And he's saying, you're, you, that's why, listen, that's why the coming of Christ, if all we had to look forward to, that, oh, he's going to bear our heart, he's going he's to nail us for all the things we did wrong and why we did it and we didn't have the right motive and, man, it's going to be awful. No, every man will have praise of God. That's why it's a blessed hope. We're looking forward to the return of Jesus. We're not dreading it. Looking forward to seeing Him. It's, it's something we're anxious for and looking forward to. You've got to be as optimistic and as hopeful as a little boy. A man came up to a little league game. He asked the boy in the dugout what the score was. The little boy said, 18 to nothing, we're behind. Boy, the man said, I bet you're discouraged. The little boy said, why should I be discouraged? We haven't been up to bat yet. <laughs> hmm? That's hope. That's hope. And, and listen, we have a blessed hope. And we're looking for the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And until then, let's be sincere and without offense until we see Christ. Amen? Let's stand together for prayer, shall we? Heavenly Father, take the truth here this evening and Lord, I, I pray that each of us, you'd help us to be sincere. Lord, there's none of us here. We're, we're all made of the same thing. We're flesh. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. The only good in any of us is the good that Jesus Christ is in our life. And so, Lord, we realize that we have faults and failures, and I pray that none of us would try to pretend we don't. We do. And so, Lord, I pray that we would give those to you and we allow you to cover them with your blood and we would not try to cover them with our hypocrisy. Father, I pray you'd help us to be without offense to others. We would be considerate of not just our conscience, but the conscience of others as well. What our influence is on other people. That our influence would be one that would help others to live for God and not push them further from God. And Lord, I pray that you'd help us to be faithful until and be looking forward till we see Jesus. Lord, we're looking forward to seeing Him. I'm thankful for the promise that he said he will come again and receive us unto himself. What a day, glorious day, that will be. And I pray, Lord, you keep us faithful until that day. Thank you again for our time together here this evening. Dismiss us now with your care, Lord. Make us mindful that you go with us from this place tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Well, we're going to sing together. The windows of heaven are open. It's 128 in the book if you need that. And uh, let's sing. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. You ready? The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my heart since Jesus made everything right. I gave him my old tattered garment. He gave me a robe of pure white. I'm feasting on manna from heaven. And that's why I'm happy. And that's why you're happy. And that's why we're happy tonight. All right. God bless you. Hold on. What do you got? Oh, that's right. I, I had a card. I don't know what I did with it. Ladies.